Hello there everyone, I'm UXW Bill and today I'm making a video for you even though at this particular time of the night I should probably be off inspecting my eyelids. Today's video is actually a sort of answer to a request that I received recently to engage in some further discussion about my Dell Dimension 8300. To make a long story at least a little bit shorter, though I would recommend you go back and watch the relevant video concerning this computer if you have an excessive number of questions, this is a computer that I bought new all the way back in 2004. I pulled out all the stops. This was supposed to be a great machine, and yet its performance never lived up to the promise. This thing made me so mad at times that I seriously just considered slinging it. And again, in the effort of making a long story at least a little bit shorter, I later bought a second-hand Dell Dimension 8300 on eBay to find out for sure, even though I had talked to other people who said the Dimension 8300 was a very competent performer. I wanted to find out if the entire species was a dud, or if this particular machine just happened to be one that never worked right and did not give its owner a particularly warm, fuzzy feeling down inside. It turned out that the eBay machine was everything it should have been and more, and up until recently, it was still the primary computer on the desk in my bedroom. So, whenever I'm asked about making a video, I always try to think of ways to make it relevant. To make it interesting and worthwhile to watch, because believe me, I know the way that I could get to going on about stuff. And contrary to all practical reasoning, a lot of you people seem to really enjoy it when I voice my protracted and obnoxious opinions about things. But I couldn't really figure out anything I should say about this machine that would be worth a video until just a couple of days ago, when it did something of earth-shattering notoriety. <laughs> <laughs> the battery ran down, specifically the CR2032 clock battery that keeps the time and date set in this machine. This is the original battery, and so today, what are we going to do? Well, we are going to replace that battery. I noted with a great deal of interest that Duracell has recently changed these to reflect the danger of a child inadvertently swallowing one of these batteries. And really nasty things can happen if that takes place. Although they didn't put an emergency phone number or anything on the battery, despite the fact that there is usually one to be found somewhere on the packaging. They just put a picture of a child with a no symbol pasted over it. I don't know how many children would be smart enough to recognize that, but I certainly hope there are more than a few adults in the viewing audience who recognize such a thing. Anyway, time to go ahead and pop this machine open. This is not something I can do readily one-handed, as this is one of those plastic clamshell case Dell machines that everyone loves so much, and you need two hands to open these because there is a button to press here at the top, and then there is another button to press here at the bottom. So I will do that, and then I will be right back. All right, welcome back. I have returned, and what's more, I have prepared the battery for installation by removing the protective sticker from the positive side of the battery in preparation for the installation. As previously noted, the battery that's in this machine now, come on, focus candy ham, there we go, <laughs> is the factory original from Dell. And I don't blame it for having run down after all of these years. In a machine that sees no power, these batteries, these little CR2032 button cells, they can last as few as three years. But most of the time, one of these systems has at least standby power. You can see the LED on the motherboard shining away right there, even after all the years that it has spent illuminated, and it is illuminated at all times. And so those batteries usually do last quite a bit longer, because they're only called to keep the real-time clock and the non-volatile memory settings intact whenever the system is not actually connected to a power source and the power supply can't do its little standby power thing. Now, unfortunately, I seem to have mislaid my screwdriver or my car key or any implement by which I could remove this battery. But there's something to take care of first, and that's to make sure that the system does not have any power. 
even though it's unlikely that it would hurt anything, might as well take the precaution because it's a lot cheaper than a replacement system board for these machines. So let's see if I can get this out of here just by pushing on that release tab with my finger. It certainly doesn't look like I can. Let's see if I can find something here in the computer mess room to make it a little bit easier. As proof that I have no shortage of preparation work that goes into my videos, here is an expertly, completely randomly chosen <laughs> package header from a Sony HF series tape, and that didn't seem to do the job, so what are we going to do now? <laughs> i got to do something. Oh, I thought I saw a screwdriver. This is probably a mistake. Don't do what I do. I'm a bad example. But it worked. <laughs> Mind you, the management accepts no responsibility for damage to motherboards, countywide uh, power outages, black holes, or anything worse that may happen. Landed perfectly on that little serial ATA cable. And now we're do oh, now it's underneath the expansion cards. You can see there's quite a bit of expansion in this unit. Radeon X1300, Adaptec 2940UW, Sound Blaster Auto G2 ZS, Dell factory specification, and an ATI TV PCI card of some kind. The only board, nope, nope, it's still in here. The modem is still in here. Hard to believe that A, I wasted my money on a modem when this machine was new, and B, that I haven't removed it after all these years. So I'm going to do just exactly what they tell me not to do on the battery packaging. I'm going to put the battery on my tongue and see if it's got any energy left in it. And it's just about completely flat, which figures because this machine, the moment it lost power, it was losing its time and date. They say you're not supposed to touch these batteries when you install them, but I really can't see a good way of avoiding doing that. Let's go ahead and turn things back on here. I won't be surprised if the system actually does power up because it's probably lost its non-volatile memory settings. Yep, it's not very happy with me. <laughs> now you might be sitting here and thinking, Self, did I really just watch a video featuring UXW Bill installing nothing more than a CR2032 battery in his Dell Dimension 8300 desktop? Well, I'm pleased to say that no, you did not. You have actually watched a video, or rather you will soon be watching a video, where UXW Bill has not only installed a replacement CR2032 battery in a Dell Dimension 8300, he's also going to install a battery in an Optiplex 740 Enhanced Series system, which while still maintaining its time and date, is complaining about having a dead battery. So we'll go ahead and pop this out of here. Landed right there on the bottom of the system chassis. And then I'll go ahead and try to open the new battery package while running the camera, which will probably end as badly as I expect it to. And then I will remove the protective tape from the battery. I trust you're all holding your breath, or at least waiting with bated breath, to see what will happen when UXW Bill reaches into the system chassis and delivers the gift of life to the system's real-time clock in the absence of external power. Dun, dun, dun. I'm sure many of you are undoubtedly very well aware of my policy of getting things done in an exceptionally and unusually expedient fashion. Installing these replacement CR2032 batteries was, of course, absolutely no exception. Oh, all right, I'll quit pulling your leg and messing around, and I'll be serious, or at least as serious as I ever happen to be, to try and give this video some sort of a redeeming quality. As I previously mentioned during the opening sequence of this video, this Dell Dimension 8300 and I have not gotten along well over the years. This machine has never been the performer that it should be. Well, guess what, folks? I'm pleased to tell you that I think I finally figured out the reason why. And believe me, I do not want for experience when it comes to addressing most types of computer problems. And I'm usually able to solve just about any computer problem that anyone can come up with. 
Am I an expert? Well, maybe that's a little bit of a strong way to put it, but I'm certainly one of those people who generally knows what he's doing when it comes to working with a computer. But I think you'll agree when I share with you the exact nature of the problem that you'll find it as much of a head-scratcher as I certainly did. Now, some of you in the viewing audience might be asking, well, why didn't you just call Dell and have them put it right? To be honest with you, I don't know that Dell would have figured it out. Maybe through some miracle they would have. This computer has only ever had warranty service from Dell once in its life. I made the rather foolish decision when it was new to order it with a factory installed iOmega Zip 250 drive. This was during the time when the Zip drives had well and truly outlived their usefulness and the drive that Dell installed in this computer from the factory, as well as the one they subsequently put in as a warranty replacement, never, ever worked correctly. It would devolve into the click of death, even with brand new fresh media, and in this age of compact disc recordables and USB flash drives, I gave completely up on the idea. So what was the problem with this machine? Well, some of you may recall, especially if you've gone back and watched the first video like I told you to do, that this system was ordered with a Pentium 4 Press Hot 3.4 GHz microprocessor, pretty much as good as it got in the land of the Socket 478, at least for desktop users. There are no bloated caps in this system. As you can see, Dell kitted it out with a vastly upgraded heatsink. And because of its lackluster performance, I tore into the system in an angry way one day and replaced the 3.4 GHz Prescott with a 2.8 GHz Northwood. And it did perform better. Lest you think there was not adequate justification for my actions, it actually did result in the system performing better, but it was still not performing anywhere near as well as it should. And when it was equipped with either of those microprocessors, the fan, the system's CPU cooling fan, had a nasty habit of accelerating to the rate of a vacuum cleaner and running madly in what seemed like a vain effort to try and keep the system unit cool. Now granted, it did not do this without justification, and it didn't run at full throttle all of the time. Lest some of you think, hey you idiot, <laughs> a fan that's running at full throttle all the time is obviously defective, but if you're thinking it was the fan, you are absolutely correct. Listen to the fan that's in there now, and I'm sure you'll agree it sounds a lot different than a vacuum cleaner. It's running nice and quietly. Almost never picks up its speed now. So what happened and what did I do? Well, the fan finally failed in this system. I turned it on one day and I noticed that the fan was only twitching. Now, the fan in this system was in sad shape. It had run so hard at times in the past that the blades all had tiny stress fractures in them, which again might have been a hint that something was not entirely quite right with the fan. So on the day that the fan stopped running, I had a couple of spares from scrapped out Optiplex GX200 series systems, and I put one in here. Got the system back up and running beautifully. Then I took the old fan over to my variable power supply, and I hooked it up. And I discovered that even sinking three some odd amps into it, which was just about all my variable limited current power supply, my bench power supply could manage to do, was just barely enough to get the fan to twitch. So I'm willing to bet that that fan had some sort of a manufacturing defect and some kind of an overcurrent problem from the day that it was manufactured. But look at the gauge of wire. It's the red and black and white braided wire that you can see right there that actually carries power to the system fan. And tell me what you think about 12 volts at 3 amps going over not only that, if, if not more current than that, because the fan did try to run in this system more so than it ever did on my regulated power supply. So clearly this thing was providing more power to it than my regulated power supply could. Think about how the motherboard traces, which are very thin, and that dainty little wiring bundle there felt about being subjected to carrying that kind of current. It's just unreal. It amazes me that it never poached anything on the board, or zorched anything, or blew anything up. This system board put up with this mistreatment, although not as severe of a case, because obviously the fan did run much more closely approximating properly when the system was younger. It was only in relatively recent times that I had noticed that it stalled out. I couldn't tell you what I was doing in this system 
only that I was there. So I've replaced the fan in all its sweetness and light, but at the same time, I'm pleased to report that this system now performs exactly like it should. And to try and prove that to you, we'll do a couple of rapid fire things here. This is not a real harsh multitasking test, but it'll give you a little bit of an idea. This system was never this zippy in its previous days, but now I can sit here and I can switch amongst browser tabs, all kinds of stuff. Sooner or later I'll find the tab I'm looking for. There it is. Yahoo's homepage, which for some reason is missing the Yahoo logo. We can even switch to applications. So there you have it, folks. All these years later, I finally managed to figure out what was ailing this machine, and that, I thought, was definitely worth the creation of a video. So I certainly hope that you have stuck it out with me this far. But if not, well, I guess you'll never get to know what I did to fix the machine. Now, will you? And since this computer has gone from making me incredibly angry to incredibly happy now, well, I am pleased to report that I think it has earned a treat. You know, these mechanical ball mice were such a big deal back in the day when it was just cool to have a mouse, period. But I think they've kind of outlived their usefulness, especially this one, which really doesn't, uh, doesn't track the way that it's supposed to. So I think it's time to go ahead and treat this computer to a brand new mouse. Install software first. We don't need no stinking software. This is just a computer mouse. Unless you think that you're going to get away without my saying it, once again I hasten to point out that real computers not only have, but also make use of their PS2 ports. And if you think that that extension cable is perhaps unnecessary, well, just wait until I get around to making a video about using a downright prodigious number of USB cable extenders to make a billion electrical engineers cry out in terror and then be utterly ignored. If I can ever find the cables and the extenders to go with them, that is. All right, I've rambled on long enough. It's only a mouse, but still, smoke test! <laughs> because I know you all love it so. Let's see what we get here. It hasn't illuminated just yet. Maybe it's worth what I paid for it. I don't know. I've never had an optical mouse hooked up to this computer in the past. And there we have the Adaptec Expansion ROM notice telling us that there are no SCSI devices presently attached to this computer, though there certainly have been in the past. And we still have nothing from Mr. Mouse, so maybe I don't have as good of a connection here as I thought. Or maybe in my haste to continue making this video, I pushed together something that probably shouldn't have been pushed together. I'm still not seeing any sign of life from that. Don't know what could be up with that. There it goes! It's pulsating in what is probably a most unhealthy manner. But we'll see if this thing actually comes to life here. Oh yeah, that works. Not only is that fast, it's also slicker than snot on a doorknob. Whee! I think I can safely slow this down a pretty good bit. Yeah, that might be a little too slow. We'll go a little bit faster than that. But there's no doubt that this is a much higher DPI resolution mouse than the old optical job before it. Alright, that concludes all of my rambling. So as always, thank you for watching and by all means, feel free to leave a comment if you should happen to have one.